Hi, this is going to be the lecture on standing waves. Now, before we actually start looking at standing waves, we need to get some background out of the way. So here I've got a simulation, and it's one of those FET simulations from the University of Colorado. And it shows us a string, and the string has got beads on it just to show more clearly how it's moving, and it's because they move very slowly, like unrealistically slowly, but it allows us to see the motion. So I'm going to move this um, wrench thing up and down a bit, and you can tell it's creating. I'm creating a kind of um, shape that moves along the string. And then, and that's crucial, when it hits the end point, it gets reflected, but it flips. Like when it comes to a fixed point, it bounces back and it flips. So the underlying reason, again, is really we put a solve the wave equation for that for with a fixed boundary condition. I'm not going to do that right now. We can just accept it as an observed um, fact. All right. So. Let me just do it maybe with this pulse as well. I can do it this way. Um, I press here and that comes as a triangular pulse. It's not going back and forth. Now, so one thing you note is that if I have this dumping here, um, there's none. And if I have this, then the pulse will just stay the same size and keep going forever. If I turn on the damping, it will mean it gets smaller over time. So it gets reflected, but it gets smaller bit more realistic and of course I could change the tension here and will change the speed it's going to be relevant down the line we're trying to calculate what the standing waves are for a particular piece of string say all right so important fact pulse gets reflected or any wave gets reflected and gets reflected and thereby flips if the end is fixed now if I have a loose end here and this is sort of I guess simulated by this kind of setup where there's some kind of pole and this ring can move up and down. Um, let me show you. So I'm just going to have a triangular pulse again. Um, and make it a bit more narrow. Go like this. There. What you notice now, actually, let me, let me re do this again. Let me turn the damping off. Oops, I want a uh, pulse and I would like a loose end. And so no damping. Put the tension down a bit too. It's not as fast. What you'll notice in this case, the pulse travels over here and then it gets reflected, but it gets reflected on the same side. So if the end is open, it doesn't flip. If the end is fixed, it does get flipped. So in this case, there's one closed end here, one open end here. Those distinctions are going to be again relevant later on. All right. Now, the next thing I could do here is let me go back to a fixed end. Um, and we said, if I go to oscillate, right, it will create a continuous pulse or continuous, um, you know, continuous sine wave rather, and then these get reflected back and thereby they'll interfere with the wave that's coming in. So there's a constantly a wave being produced here that moves to the right, but it also gets reflected if it turn the dumping off, um, which lead to this sort of behavior. Now, depending on the frequency and the length and so on, you might see different patterns here. And one particular pattern you might find is a standing wave, but not right now. Although you can tell it, it keep, does do some sort of funny, funny things that we could explore further. The point here is if I have a continuous wave, right, it just keeps going, it gets reflected the same. You just don't see it in the same way as for a pulse because it's interfering with the incoming wave. And then it gets reflected another time back and forth and sort of keeps building up and canceling out depending on the particular frequencies in question. We're going to explore that in more detail. All right, so those are the basics out of the way. Those are the ideas we're going to need. So again, the key facts we're going to need. One, if a wave, a wave gets reflected when it hits a boundary, and if it's an open end where the, the end pieces can move up and down, then it won't flip. When it's a closed end or a fixed end, the end piece is fixed, then it will flip. I'm not going to justify why that is right now. I'm going to treat it as an observation, observational fact. The second key thing we're going to need is the principle of superposition. So now the specific scenario we're going to look at is when I send a sine wave down a string. Right? So what does it look like? I'm sending a sine wave down, and I drew it as sort of a finite length, but we imagine it's continuous, it just keeps coming. 
then hits an end point. I drew it like a fixed end, but it doesn't really matter. Either way, it's going to come back as a sine wave, right? Because the shape it goes in gets reflected. So now the sine wave keeps coming, but the front piece is already being reflected and travels back. So you could have two sine waves that travel in opposite directions and they interfere with each other. So that's what we get. Two sine waves. And they're identical, identical in magnitude and wavelength. The same um, a, lambda, omega, right? All those values are the same. Um, traveling in opposite direction. They interfere with each other. So we're going to figure out what happens, right? And when you'll be doing the lab, or maybe you've done the lab already, um, you will have um, done this graphically, right? So you do sine waves, and you've, you've sort of added them up, up point by point. We're going to do it algebraically. All right, let's add two sine waves. Okay, what's the sine wave here? Um, let me get a color. So the one traveling to the right, it's going to be... Um, the displacement for this one is called a D going to the right, dr um, of x and t, right? So x being the position along the string, it's equal to the amplitude times the sine of kx minus omega t. And then the other one here, let's call it the displacement of the left traveling wave. Um, as a function of position and time, is a sine um, kx plus omega t, right? Because plus time, it means the function, the thing is a function of x, the shape that you see in the string, gets shifted to the left um, as t gets bigger, whereas with the minus sign, it gets shifted to the right as t gets bigger. We talked about that in the lecture on wave kinematics. So now we're going to add those two um, functions. We're going to see what happens. All right, let's do it. All right. So the total displacement we're going to get when adding two sine functions. Well, first of all, it's also a function of position and time, of course. All right. So it's going to be the wave traveling to the right going to add to it the wave traveling to the left, right? So principle of superposition, I just add the displacements. Let me write it out. A sine kx minus omega t, so that's my, the one I had blue previously, A sine kx plus omega t. Now, what can I do with this? Here's what we're going to do. We're going to use a trig identity. Right, you've got a sine function, in this case a sum of two. Is there some trig identity we can use? You can check in your textbook, um, in the appendix, there's a list of trig identities in the math section. You could also just go online or have some other reference work that will list you hundreds of different identities for weird trig functions you've never even heard of. Right? So, ours is going to be fairly simple. We are going to use the following. We're going to use the fact that sine now, that's the sum of two angles. We write it like this. So any two angles get added um, or maybe subtracted. So I'm going to write two identities at the same time, plus or minus. When you pick plus, you're going to stick with the top line of signs, of symbols. Um, it be sine alpha, cosine beta, and then plus or minus cosine alpha sine beta, right? So what is this saying? It's saying pick any two angles and you add them, it's going to be sine of the first, cosine of the second, plus cosine of the first, sine of the second, or take the sine of any two angles, a minus alpha minus beta, well then it's going to be, that's equal to sine alpha cosine beta minus cosine alpha sine beta, right? So plus with plus, minus with minus, top with top, bottom with bottom. So we're going to use those. What are our alphas and betas? Well, our alpha is kx, our beta is omega t, right? That is the, the sort of shape. 
Um, so for us, here we have alpha is kx and beta is omega p. Right? This is a general identity that how you can find it in your textbook or online or wherever you look. Um, in our case, the alpha and beta are kx omega t. They're functions of x and t, but who cares? Right? There's still there's still values inside the sine function. Okay, so those trig identities I should add. Um, I don't expect you to remember them, although maybe with enough enough practice you might remember at least the basic ones. But it should be something that's like part of your physics toolbox. Like you know it's there, and if you need them, you can get out your toolbox and look them up and use them. Right? It's something you have to have to have like on your radar as a thing that's out there that might be useful at times. All right, so. Let, let's plug this in and see what happens. So the one thing I'm going to do right away um, is I'm going to actually factor out the A. Right, so I'm going to get A. It's A and A, same A, right? Now comes this one here, sine kx minus omega t. I'm going to use this. So sine kx cosine omega t. Now this has a minus sign, so I'm going to use the minus identity. So I'm going to put minus sign here. Then it's the angles the other way around. Um, cosine kx sine omega t. And maybe I could sort of do it like this, make it a bit clearer what's going on. Right. So that is the first function here rewritten using that identity. It looks more complicated, so why are we doing it? You'll see in a second. Um, I'm going to add the second one. I already took out the a, so I'm going to add to this sine kx cosine omega t, right, this has a plus, so I'm now using the plus identity with the plus sign here, the first term is the same, plus cosine kx sine omega t. Now you can see why we did what we did, hopefully, um, because some of the stuff is going to cancel out, right, I've got minus cosine kx sine omega t and plus cosine kx sine omega t. So this cancels with this, and those two are the same. So I can very conveniently just write this as 2a sine kx cosine omega t. Right? So a little bit of algebraic gymnastics using the, the identity actually gave us a simpler result. Now, what's nice about this? Well, this function here has a term that's position and a term that's time. Right? Cosine omega t, this suggests just this is essentially simple harmonic motion. Right? Up and down omega t. Um, 2a kx is if you if you pick a particular value of x, like a pretty particular point along the string, right, it'll fix the value of this. So this is this whole thing, it's the amplitude of oscillation at the point x. All right, let's draw this. Okay, so here's a picture of the situation that we've got now. Right? So I, this function here, that is the 2a sine kx. Right now, of course, k is related to lambda via this relationship here. And so let's find the points where this function here goes to zero. Well, it's zero when x equals zero, which is why to start. The sine of zero is zero. Now, when is it zero next? Well, the sine function goes to zero again when the thing inside it, the argument of the sine function, is equal to pi. Right? So pi equals kx. So it happens here. So let me write kx equals pi. Now, of course, k is related to lambda via this, and so at this point here, um, x is equal to lambda over 2, right? But we're plugging in for, for k, 2 pi over lambda, and rearranging. So this is half a wavelength of the wave that's traveling down, it's bouncing back and forth, right? Bouncing one way, bouncing back, I get, get this pattern here. And then the next one, you can probably imagine, next time it, the sine function becomes zero is when the thing inside the sine function is equal to 2 pi, right? So here, k 
kx equals 2 pi, which means that x is equal to lambda. So now I've got one wavelength from here to here. And this one here, you can imagine kx equals 3 pi and x equals 3 lambda over 2, or one and a half wavelengths. Then the next one, it's going to be kx equals 4 pi. Again, sine function becomes zero and the thing inside is 4 pi. So x is equal to um, 4 lambda over 2, or just, just 2 lambda, twice the wavelength. All right. Now, of course, this could keep going, right? I just had to stop it somewhere. Somewhere there's a point where it gets reflected. Now, this cosine function, right, is a function of time. So it says, I look at one point. Let's take this point right here. So I plug in the x value, it's a little bit over half a wavelength, or maybe 0.6 wavelength. So I plug 0.6 wavelengths into here, and for x, and I get some value. Okay, this is this value here, or maybe this value down here, doesn't matter, right? So then my amplitude at this point is 2a times the sine of the value right here. And now, this is an amplitude because what this is telling me is that at that point the displacement oscillates like a cosine function, like simple harmonically between those two points. Here, the value of 2a sine kx is bigger. Right here it would be, I think, 3 quarters um, pi. kx is 3 quarters pi. So this is 3 quarters wavelengths. Sorry, 3 halves pi or 3 quarters wavelength. This value of x right here. And it goes up and down again cos and omega t. So what do you see? You see this whole string go up, it goes up, up here, down here, it flips like this. Right? Over here it flips like this. It keeps going up and down. So it looks like the wave is no longer traveling, it looks like it's sort of just going up, down, up, down, up, down in the same spot. Even though we know that this is a combination of, of a wave, sine wave traveling this way and a sine wave traveling that way. But we've shown mathematically that that superposition ends up looking like nothing's moving at all sideways, it's just oscillating in place with different amplitudes. The amplitudes themselves make a sine um, pattern along the string. And of course, how close those are together depends on the wavelength, the value of k. How quickly is it going up and down? Depends on omega, right? And those, those were values that, that were taken from the initial function, the initial sine wave that we sent down the string um, in the first place. All right, now, if we imagine, right, there's a sine wave coming from far away and it's coming in and it doesn't, there's no damping, or it doesn't get, get smaller. It just keeps coming in, it bounces back, this is what we would see. But that's not the whole story. Right, what I might imagine is, I, I have this point fixed, I've got two ends of my string fixed, and then I jiggle maybe right here, right next to it, up and down. And that jiggle creates the initial wave that's going to travel down the string. Because I can't jiggle this point, because this point is fixed, but I can jiggle the point right next to it. I'll show it to you in a demonstration in just a second. So I jiggle it here, just a little bit. It's going to create a little sine wave, it's going to travel down, it's going to bounce back, and that would create that sort of pattern, except now it, the sine wave comes traveling back this way, and it's going to bounce forward again. All right. But is the time, is the, the sine wave that bounces forward again after having on this way, having come back, bouncing this way again, is that sine wave in sync with the existing sine wave? Right? Is it in sync with the initial sine wave that um, that went down down the string. Well, it depends, right? It depends. So let's find. I figure out the condition for it to it to be in sync. So here's what we got. Let's write this down again. We've got the initial wave, right? The sine wave. And then we add to it the reflected wave. And it might flip or not flip, depending on is it open or closed end. But now this wave travels back the other end of the string, and it's sent forward again. So 
then you're going to get this. So second reflection. And of course, this one gets reflected again, right? Third reflection. Now, in, in, in reality, of course, each wave is going to be a little bit less than the previous one because of um, the friction with the different fibers of the string or air resistance, all those, those messy little things in real life. But at least in principle, you could imagine it keeps bouncing back and forth for a long time, right? And it keeps going. So the question is, right, is not that do those ones build up? They build up. We've proved it mathematically, right? They do this. But the question then is, is this reflected wave, it gets reflected again, is this one interfering with this one, like it gets superimposed on the existing ones, does it add more to it, or does it does it take away by being pointing the wrong way, right, by essentially having a, a displacement in the opposite direction as this one? And the question is, do these add constructively? Constructively means they add and they, they you know make each other bigger rather than cancel each other out. Because if they add constructively, then those ones are also going to add constructively, and the next next iteration of this is going to add, right? So really, it's kind of the key to understand: are those two in sync? Or under what condition are they in sync? Well, so to be in sync, or the more technical term would be in phase, having the same phase going up and down at the same points in time, um, to be in sync, what has to be true? Well, the total distance traveled by the time, by the second reflection, Is what? Well, it's it's there and back again. What is that? It's twice the length of the string. The length L of the string. So that's the total distance traveled. That's one piece of information we're going to need. Now, what do we want? Well, it needs to have traveled a whole number of wavelengths, right? If it's traveled, like, if it's traveled five wavelengths this way, five wavelengths back, then it's going to start a new wave at the same time that this one starts a new wave. It, on, if on the other hand, it traveled, you know, some way there, some way back, and now it's halfway through its cycle, it's going to be a mess, right? It's going to get reflected, and and now it points the other way because it's the wrong part of the cycle. Now, if, of course, it gets flipped, right, on this end, but it gets flipped again, those two flips are going to cancel each other out and not really have any effect that we have to take into account. Um, it's going to be different when we have a string that's open and closed like on opposite ends. We'll talk about it in a second. Um, right now, wave goes one way, wave goes back, to be in sync with the initial wave, or the next, you know, iteration of, of sine curves that's coming in, it must have traveled a whole number of wavelengths, so it's in the same part of the cycle. Needs to be in same part of cycle Up on second reflection, which implies so I E, or therefore, right, or it, that means it is, um, it must have completed a, a integer number of wavelengths. Uh, 
as long as it's the integer number of cycles, so the distance must have been an integer number of um, of wavelengths. Hopefully you can read this wavelength is supposed to say. <laughs> Alright, let's write this down. The distance is 2L, twice the length L of the string. So we've got the upshot is the condition is 2L equal to n times lambda um, where where n right is is one two three one of those depends on l depends on on lambda but that's the crucial condition right? n is an integer all right so another way then of saying this is if i have a string of length l right the, the waves are going to build up constructively by bouncing back and forth and form these, these, these standing waves and they keep building up as the wave bounces back and forth. Those happen for wavelengths that satisfy this, this condition. So let's write this out. Um, in other words, for a given length of string, and that's usually what you got, you know, you got a piece of string, it's fixed between two points. Um, what is the you can't change that length of string the and right now we're fixed on both ends maybe we should say that right um, so we can ignore the flips you could imagine it's it's open on both ends this has to be the same, so it flips on both ends, so it doesn't flip at all, so I can ignore the flipping. Both ends. Only those wavelengths lambda is equal to, let's rearrange this, 2L over N with n being a well, natural number, it can't be negative, but 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Only those wavelengths um, that satisfy this for some value of n, right? But n equals 1, sure, n equals 2, sure, n equals 3, sure, but not n equals, you know, 2.9. Um, only those wavelengths will form standing waves. If you've got a different wavelength, right, you pick a different one, what's going to happen? The wave's going to come in, and on the first reflection, you get this pattern. But by the time it reflects back again, it might be out of sync, and then it'll destroy the existing pattern, and it won't ever build up to, to large oscillations, right? If, on the other hand, this condition is satisfied, then after a second reflection, the wave will build up on the first, and you get large um waves and in that case you then actually call them standing waves. Now if lambda is this, the frequencies that are allowed, and well I get those by getting v over lambda, right? So um so the frequencies that form standing waves they will be equal to um, the speed of the wave on the string divided by 2L times N. All right, just plugging in this for lambda here. So these frequencies will form standing waves. So the wavelengths determined by the length, the frequency, of course, determined by the wavelength and the speed. So, you know, those are the, the factors that are going to feature what frequencies um, of wave form standing wave. Why might we want to go to frequency? Well, often it's easier to generate a given frequency than say a given wavelength but of course you can always translate back and forth um, and then of course as a side not note of course 
for a string, the speed is this, as we know, um, maybe experimentally, or maybe we've proved it via the, the wave equation. All right, yeah, let's look at this in action. Right? It sounds very abstract, hopefully it made sense, but let's actually look at it in action. The setup I have is I have a frequency generator here that creates a vibration in this device at a frequency that I can set. I can change those, those knobs here, twiddle with them a bit, and I wanna get any frequency from essentially zero to a thousand hertz and beyond, but we're not going to go that high. Um, and I've got this string here. Now this piece here, these are two little metal um, skewers sticking up straight. They just hold the string in place, stop it from moving sideways. So you can only really move up and down. On the other side, you can see a pulley, and that string runs over that pulley, and hanging from it, there's a mass. Right now, the mass is 200 grams. So I'm going to try to find the standing waves just by looking at the oscillation of the string. So it's set currently to 40 hertz, that's our starting point. Uh, let's go from there. I'm going to turn it on. You can already tell we're kind of fairly close. So if you look at this, you can see an um, antinote here, a note here, an antinote here, but, but maybe just approximate. Let's see if we can find it a little bit better. Um, see if I go to maybe 41. Okay, it's getting a bit bigger. Oh, now it's all over the place. What's happening? That's not it. Really, that was much better. Okay, here we are. Maybe that this seems... I think that's pretty good. So you can clearly see there's a node right here. There's a node at the end. That's a boundary condition. Right? It can't move. It's on the pulley. There's a node here on that end. So this thing here obviously has to move up and down a little bit. But the node is right at the end. You can clearly tell, right now I've got one whole wavelength. So this is 44 hertz, which tells me that the fundamental should be at half that value. Let's have a look, see if we can find that. So I'm going down to 22. That looks pretty good to me. It's just one big antinode in the middle. Um, let's try something in between just to check. Let's say I'm at 29. Okay, so this is, I don't know what it's doing. Um, so we have 22.44. Let's try the next one, 66. So this is 66. You can probably hear the noise a little bit of this whole thing vibrating unavoidable. Um, but you can see there's a node right here, a node over there. We've got one and a half wavelengths total, three antinodes in other words. Let's go to 88 hertz. Let's find the next one. So there, there isn't much happening in between. We're not yet there. Let's go to 88. It becomes a bit harder to see, right? Because the um, the notes aren't as big, but the anti notes, sorry, aren't as big. But you can see there's one there, two, three. Indeed, we've got two full wavelengths of four anti notes. We can keep going. They're going to become harder to see because if they were like that tall, like the way the way they were for like the, the fundamental the string would actually have to stretch significantly in length, and that would mean that the wave equation is no longer accurate. So that's why it doesn't quite work that way, that we can create antinodes of arbitrary size. But let's see if we can get to 110 hertz. I overshot a bit. So, getting harder and harder to see, but I think there's a note here, note here, note here, and note right there. I think if I keep going, probably wouldn't see very much in the recording. If you're right here, we might be able to go another, another one or two or three harmonics higher, and you'd still be able to detect those notes and anti-notes. Alright, 
So let's work an example for that kind of scenario you just saw. Of course, we're going to use slightly different values. I imagine I put a string, and the string is 4 meters long. So that's a bit longer than what I had in my actual experiment. And the end of the string runs over a pulley, and I hang a weight from it, and that fixes the tension right in the string. Um, but this is the fixed point, because here this, the string is pressed against the pulley, so the wave doesn't travel beyond this point here. So those two points are fixed. Right? This one's just clamped in place. Um, I want to hang five, 5 kilograms for it, so that implies that the, um, that the tension in the string is 50 newtons. Right, mg 5 times 10, the weight is, fi is 50 newtons, it's held up by the string, the string is 50 newtons. Okay, now the string itself, I imagine it has a mass, a mass density of 5 grams per meter. Right? So 1 meter of string is 5 grams, means the whole 4 meters, in this case it would be 20 grams. Fairly light string, um, realistic value. Our task is to find the first 5 modes so harmonics right so a note sorry mo and we want to find the lambda frequent uh, wavelength frequency number of nodes and antinodes right so nodes and antinodes right those are those terms used for the different points in that standing wave pattern right these points here where there's no oscillation and it includes the end points as well those are called nodes and the points where the oscillation is largest and it's of course right in the middle because that's how sine functions work, um, those are the, the antinodes. So here I've got four antinodes and five nodes include, if you include the ones at the end, right, the fixed points at the end. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, so we asked to find how many there are um, for each of those first five modes or harmonics. Mode harmonic, of course, meaning uh, do you get one, do you get Two, do you, how many antinodes essentially have you got, as you just saw in the in the demo? Let's do the math. Right. So the first thing we need is the speed of the wave. Right. Let's calculate that. Um, find wave speed first. So V, speed of the wave, is because it's a string, it's equal to this. Right? Plug in the values, and in our case, it's 50 newtons, divided by 5 grams per, per meter, so that's 0 0.005 kilograms per meter. Of course, we have to use kilograms, because a newton is secretly a kilogram meter per second squared. Uh, so what is this? Um, according to my math, this comes to um, the square root of 10,000. Uh, of course, uh, units, um, meter squared per second squared. So the square root of that is exactly 100. So the speed is 100 meters per second along the string. So it really only takes a tiny fraction of a second for the wave to go from here to here and it will bounce back. So it will bounce 25 times from between this end and the other end. Um, so 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, up to 25 times in one second. What it means is only a very tiny little oscillation here and within one second it will build up extremely, extremely quickly. Okay, so that is my, my wave speed. Now we're ready to, to find the wavelength. So, so L, um, sorry, lambda, let's call it lambda 1. Right, lambda 1 is, well, let's go through the equation. 2L over N equals 1 over 1. Right, and I'm using what we derived here. I plugged in the first N and N equals 1. L is 4 meters, so that is 8 meters. So the first wavelength that can form standing wave waves is um, 8 meters long. Now how can that be? The string is only 4 meters. Well, that's okay. We just have only half a wavelength between here and here. That's fine. What does that look like? This is my string, right? It would look essentially like this. 
and you saw that in a demo and this will, this will just move up and down like this right. so um, so there's one anti node and then two nodes if you include the end pieces um, sometimes you might see this label as lambda zero and then you've got a um, like zero nodes on the inside there are different ways of labeling different ways of counting them it's something to bear in mind um, but this is definitely the first one right so i'm going to call this lambda one therefore the frequency so how quickly is that oscillation well the frequency is going to be um, v over lambda one and v is 100 meters per second that stays fixed divided by 8 meters that's 12.5 hertz so 12.5 times um, second does this go up and down in other words it goes like up down up down it starts up it ends down because it's 12.5 right half um, over two seconds it'll go up and down 25 times so this is our first one anti node, two nodes. I'm just going to write down the anti nodes. Maybe you can already see that it's always going to be one more node than anti nodes if you include the endpoints. The next one, well, I can, I can just do it um, with the equation we derived: two l over two l is four, so that's just four meters. Um, and then the frequency of this one is going to be v. So it's going to be a v divided by by lambda 2 so that's 100 meters per second divided by 4 meters that's 25 hertz right. so what you notice is the the wavelength has halved the frequency has doubled right and it, it has to be so because the the product lambda times frequency has to stay the same because the wave speed is the same um, let's draw this one so I've got the wavelength is two meters, so that means I've got one full wave like this. And of course, each one goes up and down, so I can sort of sort, draw the kind of other half of it, the other envelope. So this one goes like this, oscillates most in the middle, less near the near the nodes. I've got three nodes and two anti nodes. This is my first harmonic. It's also sometimes called the fundamental, and this would be called the second harmonic or the first overtone. Of course, the, the words overtone they come from music, but those are very important if you study the physics of music, which we are going to do in a couple of lectures. Um, all right, let's keep going. Wish I'd only asked for the first three, not the first five, but we see the pattern, so we can probably stop you know, doing all the, the detailed work here. 2L over 3, what is this? 8 over 3, that is 2.67 meters. And then F3, I'm not even going to write it down, you know how to calculate it, it's 37.5 hertz. In fact, the frequency goes up in equal steps, right? We figured it out here. I had V over 2L, it's my 12.5 times 1, times 2, times 3, so I'm just increasing the frequency by the same amount each time um, whereas the the lambda is a sort of one over n relationship um, of course let me just draw this one last one i'm going to draw there right one and a half wavelengths fits in four meters All right we took four and we divided it by by three halves so three half wavelengths um, so this would be 2.67 meters, this would be 1.33 meters, and this would be 4 meters. I've got 1, 2, 3 antinodes, right? This is my number of antinodes, essentially. Um, 4 nodes if I include the end ones. And then this is my frequency. The next ones, you can imagine what's going to happen next. Um, Lambda 4 is going to be 2L over 4, so it's going to be 2 meters, and the um, frequency is going to be 50 hertz. I hope you can 
can see that. You can draw what it looks like. Five. Uh, I'm going to leave that to you to, to figure out. But I hope the pattern is clear, right? I get one more anti-node, one more node each time. There's always one more node and anti-node because they're like the two ends, if you like. Um, so always you have one more um, fence post than you have fence pieces, unless it's closed, like in a loop. Same idea here. Um, and then the frequency goes up by 12.5 each time, and the, the lambda you know, goes goes as 1 over n. So here we are at 8 divided by 4, next will be 8 divided by 5, and, um, and so on. Let's check our answer with this simulation here, right? So this represents the situation we got. L is 4 meters. Linear density of the string is 5 times 10 to minus 3 kilograms, so 5 grams per meter. Tension is 15 newtons. Um, now, I can't set the vibration frequency to lower than 45, apparently. So imagine this thing, this, this tiny little vibrations here, causing them. But that's okay. We know that the first one then should be at 50, right? We can't go to 37.5, but it should be at, at 50. So let's see what happens. You can see a little bit, not much. We're getting really close. And now we are essentially at 50. But realistically, you can get very close. And you can see how you get those big waves building up. Um, if we go a little bit beyond that, say to 57, okay, there isn't much happening here. We expect the next one to be at 62.5. You hopefully figured that one out. So let's go to 62.5. Um, I can actually fine tune this a little bit more. So we're getting really close now. You can tell as I'm getting really close, those waves keep building up. Right? What is it every time? It's a sine wave traveling down, bouncing back and forth. And this tiny little vibration here um, generating another another set of waves. All right, what's the next one? Well, it would be 75, so we're always at 12.5. So let's see how close I can get to this. Um, there we go, 75 hertz. Big standing wave, let's check. So 75 hertz would be the sixth, um, the, the, the sixth harmonic. Let's count our anti-notes. I've got one here, two here, three here, four here, five here, and six here. Our anti-notes, one at the end, one here, one here, one here, one here, one here, and one here. So right, those points are not moving. The string is moving around them, but this point here, the string is always staying in the same spot. All right, so our calculation seems to be correct, um, at least as far as the simulation proves it. Okay, now finally, I want to come back to the open end, right? So right now we looked at a spray st string with two closed ends, but what is if one end is open? Now for the string, it's a rather um, awkward sort of setup, really. It wouldn't really work very well in real life. I mean, maybe you could somehow do it, I don't know. But there are other types of waves where open ends are fairly common. Um, for example, if you have um, sound waves inside some kind of tube, like a lot of wind instruments are essentially based on having an, a tube that's either open on one end and closed on the other, or open on both ends. And then you create sound waves within that, that tube. Um, trombones, trumpets, flutes, clarinets, right? all, the, all those kinds of instruments, organs. They all have open ends, at least on one side. If both ends are open, the analysis is exactly the same as for the um, closed ends. Now, if one end is closed and one end is open, right? So this end is closed. Yes, this generates the, the motion, but um, after that, it's just fixed. Then things get interesting. So let's see why. So here's my pulse. And you remember that it travels back in the same direction. But now it's flipped, right? And now it flips again. Whereas when it was closed, closed, right? It, it flipped on the way back, but by the time it, it had the second reflection, it was again the right way up. So the second flip sort of cancelled out the first flip. Um, and that's relevant. We're trying to figure out if the second reflection is in sync with the initial waves, right? That was our calculation that allowed us to find those um, those
crucial wavelengths that form standing waves. Now this has to be changed now because there's this flip that doesn't get cancelled out. Right? It flips here when it comes back on the second reflection, but there was no first flip on that side. Let's look at the math of that. Okay, so here's what we're trying to do. I have a closed open string or some kind of other um, medium carrying a wave. So I put the incoming sine wave and that gets reflected when it hits the end, right? The fact that it doesn't flip, I mean, it still comes back as a sine wave. Now, on the second reflection, it gets flipped because the one end on the left hand side is closed, right? It's fixed. The other end was open. So, if I want this wave to be in sync with this one, right, what has to be true? We want these to be in, in sync, these two. So, before the condition was that essentially the wave travels a whole number of wavelengths. But now we sort of get a free half a cycle due to the flip. Before that, the flip got cancelled out by the second flip, right? But now we only get one flip, so we get like a free half a cycle. So let's write this down. Um, the flip of the wave adds one free half cycle, right? So suddenly, you get you, you go to the other half of the the cycle, right? The opposite part of the cycle. If you were down, you're now up. Uh, we have cycle, which, in other words, I could write it or a phase shift by pi, right? It's almost like you've sort of magically added pi to the inside of your of your sine function. So what does that imply then? That implies we're going to get um, the two waves to be in sync or in phase if 2L is equal to half lambda or 3 halves lambda or 5 halves lambda or 7 halves lambda, right? Like half or one and a half or two and a half or three and a half but but not a whole number of wavelengths because then the flip will mess that up mess the being in sync up if you arrive with half a wavelength difference then the flip's going to provide the the other half if I, if I arrive with three and a half wavelength three sorry three halves wavelength um then i make i, I get back in sync by adding another half that happens due to that that flip Right. So how do I can how can I write this in general? Well, two L is equal to is to n minus one half times times lambda. I could have put n plus a half, but I have to start at n equals zero. So I'm going to put n minus a half. So plugging one into here gives me this. Plugging two into here gives me this, and so on. Right. So n again is is a natural number. One, two, three, four, five, and so on. And, and then similarly, you can figure out what's the what's the frequency and so on, right? So these ones form standing waves for the open closed um, situation. So you don't often get that with a string, but for example, um, I'll just draw an example. You might have a, a sort of a pipe like this. And and then there's air air moving inside. So little the air molecules are vibrating, right? They're forming sound waves, or you can think of it as, as a pressure wave, a higher pressure, lower pressure, higher pressure, lower pressure, and so on. And at the end, the pressure P is just the atmospheric pressure, P I A T M, atmospheric pressure, because it's out in the open. Um, whereas here the pressure can be whatever. It's almost like you have one open, one closed end. Another way to think about it is at this point here, if you're an air molecule right here, you can't move, you can't oscillate because there's a wall. If you're here, you can oscillate freely, one open end, 
one closed end, right? So um, this could be, for example, a, a horn, a French horn, or, or a trumpet. Um, not a flute. A flute has two ends open. Both sides are open. Um, and, and so it's an open, open tube, which mathematically is again like the closed, closed one. Let's actually put some values to this. Let me start a new page here. And, and that's the last thing I'm going to do. Let, let's take as our example a French horn. Don't know what those look like. Go to a concert um, or just go online. So the, the length of it is it varies a bit, but let's go with 3.9 meters. It's a fairly average length of a horn. Um, of course, it's of the pipe isn't three and a half meters, 3.9 meters long. That wouldn't fit on any into any orchestra, um, at least not without much difficulty. But it, it's wound up, right? So you have a horn. Um, it's sort of here's the open part, and then and then it sort of winds around a couple of times like this, and then eventually somehow there's the mouthpiece here, um, and that you that you that you blow in, and your mouth forms the closed end. This is an open end, and then you get standing waves inside at certain frequencies. They depend on the length of the horn, um, the initial vibration, and yeah. So this is just the idea here. And the length of this, the fact that the curve doesn't matter, length is 3.9 meters. Um, so what then are going to be my um, my wavelengths? Well, let's just plug in what we got, right? So L is is 3.9 meters, so the allowed wavelengths, the standing waves, form for lambda equals 2L over N minus a half for you know, N equals 1, 2, 3, and so on. So lambda 1 would be 2 times 3.9 divided by a half, um, so that's 7.8 divided by a half, that comes to 15.6 meters. That's the wavelength of the fundamental tone, the fundamental wave that gets created in this French horn. Um, what's that frequency? Well, the frequency is going to be the wave speed, and this is of course the speed of sound, right, because it's a pressure wave of air inside this French horn, um, divided by the wavelength, and then to the math, to the speed of sound is about 340 meters per second. It depends a bit on the temperature of the air. And if you've ever been to a concert and you watch carefully, um, or if maybe you play like a brass instrument, then you know that the temperature of the air matters, the temperature of the instrument, therefore. That's why people warm up their instruments before they, I mean, not putting on a radiator, but they start playing it, um, in order to to get to a constant temperature, so it's not going to be out of tune after you've played a couple of bars. Right. Um, so, 340 meters per second divided by 15.6 um, Now, what does that come to? I've, I've written down um, that it's, it's 21.8. Let me just double check the math here. Um, so I have, I have 340, maybe you get your calculators 2, divided by 15.6. Um, yeah, about 21.8. That seems about right. I don't know why I didn't trust my, um, my earlier calculation. 21.8 hertz. What note is this? Well, it's really low, right? It's barely in the audible range. It's almost too, too low a note for us to hear, but it's a very, very low F, as it turns out, like the note F. Um, if you compare, you know, if you look at a table of different pitches, like what they are in frequencies, we're going to talk about that more when we talk about music. Um, 
Now, of course, you can play the, the higher notes, right? The F2, we know how that works, so it's going to double it. Actually, careful here. I've almost made a mistake here, it will triple it. Um, brings us to 65.6 hertz. Why do I have to triple it? Um, let's double check. Because if I plug in n equals 2 here, right, I'm going to get divided by 3 halves and 1 half. So let's work this out explicitly. Um, got a bit ahead of myself there. Lambda 2 is 2L divided by, um, so this is, I plug in 2 divided by 3 halves, right? 2 minus 1 half is 3 halves. So that is again 2 times 3.9 divided by um, 3 halves. So that's going to be one third of this. It's 5.2 meters, and that's this. Right. So what you notice is that the you've got to be careful with this half factor here. Right. And the pattern here is I put the initial one, the, fun, the fundamental one, then I triple it, and then I go in equal steps, and I add again. Like this one is th three times this. F3 is going to be five times this, which I think is 109 hertz. Um, and so on, right? So that again follows from how lambda and v are related, and the the allowed wavelength from standing waves. Looks a bit more complicated the pattern for the open closed in and for the closed closed to open open one. But again, once once you play with numbers a bit, it should become fairly straightforward to see the next one. Should we draw it too? Um, so if this is my tube. So imagine it's curled up like that, but I'm not going to draw this. So it's closed here. Standing wave I'm going to get is going to look like this. It vibrates a lot here. This is open, right? This is a maximum vibration anti note. And there's a note here. Now for the second, this is my, this is my first um, one. This is this one here. For the second one, so in this case, it's three, um, it, it's three halves. So the, it's going to look something like this, sort of hard to draw. The oscillation is going to look essentially like this. There's an anti-node here, an anti-node here, and a node here. So this one's always fixed. This one's always open. How can you get patterns like this? Well, the F3 one, maybe you should try drawing it first. It's closed here. It's going to be open on the end. I've had simplest case, next simplest case. Well, next one would probably look something like this. Right, where it's open here, and I've got notes here, and you can tell it's, it's one half, two halves, so one, and then a quarter wavelength. This is half a wavelength, one and not, sorry, half a wavelength, three quarter wavelength. This is just a quarter of a wavelength, right? Because each note to note is half a wavelength. All right. That's it for now. I'm going to have another bonus video in which I give you another example of a closed open system um, in a totally different area of, of physics. But thanks for watching so far. In this demonstration, I'm going to sing for you. And I'm going to sing a continuous, um, I mean, a continuous sound. I start with a very low note, and then I'm going to raise it higher and higher. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to try to find a resonance frequency of this tube. In other words, the frequency at which this tube, the air inside it, forms standing waves. Now I hope you'll be able to hear this on the um, on the recording. Of course, it's a lot better if you if you're live in the classroom, or you can just try this yourself at home. All you need is a tube like this. It doesn't have to be purple. It doesn't have to be made of um, Plastic, it could be a bamboo pole, say, it could be longer, shorter, it doesn't matter. Um, you can try to sing different notes, and it's easiest if you change the, change the pitch continuously um, until you find that resonance frequency. So I'm going to try it right now. I'm going to blow over the top of it. <laughs> 